Looking for bodies and answers. Teams in Libya are still searching for people after two dams collapsed. How could structures like these fail? How safe are other dams around the world? And is climate change a factor? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, the last few years have not been easy for the people of Libya, a country divided by war and instability after the revolution that overthrew Muammar al-Qaddafi. The collapse of two dams has now brought new grief, thousands of dead or missing, with half of the eastern city of Derna wiped out in a deluge. The disaster underlines Libya's political chaos, vital and relatively modern structures collapsing after years of neglect in a broken country. But did an extreme climate event also play a role? What lessons can be learned to prevent similar tragedies elsewhere? We'll bring in our guests shortly. First, let's take a closer look at why these two dams were so vulnerable. Well, they were built in the late 1970s, but they had not been maintained in more than 20 years. This despite reports that more than $2 million was allocated for this purpose more than a decade ago. Many crucial facilities have been neglected in Libya for decades. With heavy rain, authorities say the dams didn't stand a chance. Once they collapsed, a wall of water swept through the city of Derna, sweeping away buildings and people into the sea. Our correspondent, Asur Sardar, is in Tripoli with an update. Thousands of people in the city of Derna that are still desperately waiting for the aid to arrive. So far, we have seen tens of countries across the globe keep sending the aid to the city and surrounding town. But the scale of the destruction is so immense that this aid that has arrived is significantly insufficient. People in the city of Derna are saying that they are seeing the aid is coming through the aerial vehicles, lands and sea. But so far, they haven't been able to receive enough. And now the main concern is shifting from the rescue efforts to another issue, the health issue. The officials uh, the, there are warning that an epidemic could hit the, the, the city because of the waterborne diseases. And the officials that I have talked to, they're saying they're now uh, there are expectations to evacuate the city of Derna either completely or partially in anticipation of a spread of an epidemic from the waterborne diseases. But that's not going to be an easy task because we are still talking about tens of thousands of people being stuck in the city and also the whole uh, infrastructure of the city, the roads, the ways that connect the city to the rest of the country are collapsed or destroyed. And the Libyans here are saying that they cannot do that by themselves. They need the international community more and more to be involved. But one thing is so clear that the disaster here is not over and the story is still unfolding and people are tremendously suffering. Rasul Serdar, Al Jazeera, Tripoli for the inside story. Well, let's bring in our guest now. We have joining us in West Sweden, Asma Khalifa, research fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. In Lahore, Sarah Hayat, a lawyer who specializes in climate change law, policy and advocacy. And in Tralee Island, Edmund Harty, a chartered engineer and president of Engineers Island. Well, welcome to all of you. I could start with Edmund. From what we know so far, Edmund, does it look like the lack of maintenance was a key issue here. I, th I suppose the first thing we should probably start with would be to inform viewers, uh, you know, what is a dam? And I suppose a dam is a big uh, wall, a big structure built across a river or a stream. And its main job is to is to act as a reservoir. So it's a big, uh, it's like a big uh, giant bathtub. And the water storage can be used for drinking, for irrigation of, of crops, uh, making electricity and so on. And... Um, Dams have been built for, for quite a long time. In fact, the first dam was built about uh, 3000 BC, and there is about 50,000 dams around the world. Um, the engineering of a dam is actually quite important uh, from both the design, uh, but also from the use, and uh, maintenance is an important factor as well. 
All right, let's bring in Asma then. Was this a case, from what we know so far from the, the comments which have come to light, the information which has come to light about the history of these dams, does it look like a case of political instability and perhaps even corruption disrupting maintenance? Oh, for, for certain. And even before 2011, there is a historical uh, negligence to the eastern region. It's part of the grievance between the east and the west politically now. It's driven from, uh, um, uh, it has its roots back uh, in Gaddafi's time because the east has always aligned itself with, uh, with the royal family, with the Snuzia family. Um, and so there's always been an opposition and tension with Gaddafi. And then I was also uh, um, a town particularly affected uh, by these conflicts um, yeah, over the yeah over the past decades. What is clear is that the dams have not been repaired. There's insufficient information, even though there's a company that has posted on their website that they have done maintenance between 2007 and 2012. Um, the anti-corruption report shows that, as as the as it, as it has been said, that there has been a budget allocated to it. Um, the locals uh, in Dana have been warning about it. There's been um, um, uh, seminars. The, there's a there was a study that was published uh, by a Libyan university last year um, around the fragility of these infrastructures. Um, so it's it's it is definitely a co an issue that is compounded by an uh, neglect, uh, a gross mismanagement of fund of public funds, public theft, corruption, and conflict. All right, corruption, conflict. But Sara, is it all down to maintenance and governance? Has climate change also played a role in this tragedy? So my heart goes out to the people of Libya. I want to start with that because Pakistan definitely succumbs to climate catastrophes quite frequently, and I know what it feels like. Um, to be honest, I don't think we have sufficient information at this point to determine whether this is a climate catastrophe per se. What we do know, though, is that extreme weather events are now exacerbated by climate change. Like the flood, like the floods in Pakistan in 2022, we have sufficient information now, reports, research, factual, factual data, to indicate that, yes, climate change had exacerbated those floods, made them worse. Global warming causes uh, more erratic weather patterns. It causes more erratic rainfall, torrential rainfall. And even with, with Pakistan, the monsoon cycles were increased in number. The expanse of the rainfall was across different pro uh, across different districts and provinces. And I, and I believe that even with Libya, I'm sure the intensity of the storm, the intensity of the natural disaster has been exacerbated by climate change, but we'll need to wait for more scientific evidence on that front. All right, so the jury's still out on that one, but everyone keeping an eye on what the climate is doing. Edmund, is anyone, yeah. do we know if anyone is now learning from this, carrying out maintenance on, and checks on other dams in the country? There's, these were not the only yeah. two dams and reservoirs, right? That's right. Well, I suppose, you know, there's quite a lot known about dams in the first case. And in this specific instance, I think we're going to have to wait and, and establish all the factors because, um, you know, climate change is a big factor. As I mentioned, a dam is like a, a big bathtub. And if you just have too much water going into it, it just can't take the load. Obviously, maintenance and things like that are also important. But you can also have other issues like structural failures, uh, foundation problems. Um, you know, our natural disasters can even cause dams to fail. Um, but in this instance, th there is a question about maintenance. There is a question about climate. Um, and climate is probably the biggest risk factor that's there because uh, the world is getting hotter, uh, the air uh, can carry more water, and then when there's a change in temperature, you can have a quite significant rainfall. And uh, that's the scenario that actually happens with most dams, uh, assuming that they're maintained right and, uh, 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 and so on, you know. So uh, main, looking at climate change as well as maintenance would be a big avenue of investigation for you, Edmund. Like Let, to, let's uh, bring in... Like oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I just I just want to add here, uh, definitely climate change is a factor. I, I'm sure that sci the science will support it soon, soon for Libya as well. 
But with dams, I think it's 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 important to recognize that dams are only as good as their management is really, and and we Absolutely. know that the and if dam management knows that storms are coming, and that there is going to be erratic torrential rainfall, and then they need to be cognizant of the catchment levels of that dam, and, and they have to release the spill, they have to release the excess water, which is how we manage. And Sarah, the do we think that that sort of activity was not happening? I don't have enough information to comment on that, no, but there are it, some, it, yes. It, it, All right. It Asma. wasn't happening. There were rains last year, um, and there were heavy, heavy, heavy rainfalls last year, and there, 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 and there were alarm bells ringing about the level of, of water increasing. The dams are not are not only old, but their structure is also insufficient for for to hold it to to um it's it's i mean it's an old structure uh so it needed uh also to be expanded and and, and carefully managed but this Asma, is not the first in, time in a, that, the, that in addition sorry? to that were there other areas of failure in governance it's been reported for example that communities had sprung up and been established too close to the dam oh yeah i mean um there is there is virtually almost no urban planning in in Libya, um, and it's not just the the, the it's inf uh, infrastructure like dams. It's also the roads that are not maintained. In there's entire areas in in Libya that don't have proper roads, um, and so the at the moment the, one of the biggest uh, obstacles in in getting aid and rescue mission is that the fact that most of the roads were destroyed to the town right. except to one uh, that is overwhelmed so it's it's not just the dams no it's roads it's electricity it's uh telephone uh infrastructure it's it's infrastructure in general hospitals you name it interesting i want to come back to sara and ask this question now with what we do know at least of climate change does it mean that standards standards of dam construction maintenance standards of even other aspects of urban planning really need to change now they need to catch up with the new reality we're living in absolutely i'm glad you've asked this i think because climate change is penetrating pretty much all facets of our existence we need to upgrade everything and that includes our infrastructure rehabilitating infrastructure on a routine basis should become a priority for the government. We shouldn't be waiting for natural disasters to come about before we start sort of monitoring and then talking, commenting on the maintenance of um, important infrastructure. And like and uh, like Asma also said, roads are, are part and parcel of this. Um, and also, I'd like to say here that because um, the climate impacts on the global south are by and large the same, I think Pakistan went through the same kind of uh, impacts in the wake of the 2022 floods. But with dam construction and with the kind of impacts climate change can have on dams, I think that would translate equally to the global north. Dams there are also vulnerable to climate change. They're also vulnerable to permafrost, let's say, uh, uh, weakening the foundations of dams. They're also one, and um, erratic weather patterns are going to be seen or, and are being seen even in the global north. So uh, it's important that there be technology transfer from the global north to the global south so that we can, um, we, can we can maintain and repair our infrastructure accordingly. All right, on that point, that makes me wonder, Edmund, listening to what Sarah was saying about the need for change and keeping in mind, of course, that this dam, these two dams were not that old given the life no. of dams, right? We're talking around 50 years. So... Are we safe in thinking that in writing this one off as a kind of a, a one-off freak accident? Or are there accidents waiting to happen around the world as you look at your dam map, so to speak? No, one, one should definitely write, not write this off as, as a once-off because there's lots of things changing. And I think, you know, you, you have to look at the infrastructure, the age, but also the condition and is it being maintained? And the big change that's also happening is the climate. Because, for example, a lot of these things are modelled and planned based on maybe a once in a 500 year event, but that the world is not staying uh, static. So those events are becoming an awful lot more frequent. Therefore, uh, heavy rainfall, heavy snowfall and um, excess loads on the dams uh, are likely are more likely to happen as a result of climate change. We also need to make sure in terms of urban planning that, uh, you know, that 
in the event that those events happen, uh, what happens with the floodwaters? And uh, if there's houses built in that area, that's going to be a problem, you know. Um, and then there can also be other geopolitical factors, you know, such as conflict, instability, uh, are all the things that are happening, uh, do they happen? And what's the degree of governance? And what's the policy positions? Because you have to put the resources into looking after critical infrastructure. The engineering community uh, know quite an awful lot about dams, but you have to put the resources in place that they're maintained, that they're looked after, and that you have competent people doing that. All right. You mentioned that, Edmund, I... geopolitical stability and governance. Well, let's those definitely were issues when it comes to the Libya scenario. Let's take a little bit of an mm -hmm. in-depth look into them. Libya has, of course, two administrations. Let's try and break down for you who controls what. In the West, including the capital Tripoli, the internationally recognised government of national unity is in power. It's led by Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabeba and is backed by the UN. It controls the area in purple on the map. Now, in the East, warlord Khalifa Haftar is in power, supported by a parliament in Tobruk. He controls the areas in orange. His, his self-styled rather army is backed by Russia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. The rest of the country shown in grey is under the control of various armed groups. So, Asma, looking at that kind of scenario, if we start thinking about political instability, geopolitical challenges, we might have a long list of countries which are susceptible to this kind of problem, not just Libya, right? Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. The list can get very long very quickly. Indeed, countries that have underwent conflict or, under, or are undergoing conflict are countries that are susceptible and fragile, not just infrastructure um, and, and, and structural and politically. They are fragile in responding. They're fragile uh, in the way they would coordinate and uh, and react uh, in preparedness because they they allocate their resources to other things, right? To continuous wars and military campaigns, which is the case for Libya. That's where a lot of the budgets go. Additionally, countries like that, like Libya, they securitize everything. One of the biggest challenges of the past days in coordinating between the East and the West is the fact that they are treating the disaster as a military campaign. They are establishing checkpoints. They are running around with these military, um, you know, armored vehicles, um, obstructing sometimes movements, being unhelpful for no reason whatsoever. It's just that's how they respond. When the rain was start, when uh, the rain was falling heavily in uh, in 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 Friday on Friday and Saturday. Um, the response from both the East and the West, uh, although separate, was, was similar in, in that they asked, they've established curfews. They asked people to remain at home, which is their response when clashes occur. Sarah, you were talking a moment ago about the need to update dams and infrastructure. Do we have any idea? Does anyone actually follow, keep track of how many dams around the world right now might be obsolete because of climate change? I think uh, people prob countries probably do monitor and they should be monitoring, especially in wake of the kind of climate catastrophes we're seeing on a routine basis. Um, and but uh, but that said, I think what should also be touched upon here very briefly is whether this narrative surrounding dams as the go-to solution to combat climate change is a good one. Maybe we can talk about alternative solutions instead of dams, especially given dams are vulnerable to climate impacts. And then, you know, if they require uh, a lot of, of, of a lot of financing, a lot of funding to maintain and to uh, keep. So um, what are uh, the alternatives then, Sara? For a country like Pakistan and for many countries in the global south, we should have better drainage systems. We should have better sewerage systems. Infrastructure in Pakistan, including a lot of our smaller dams, are um, a colonial legacies. They were constructed in the colonial times, and, and, and that's a problem. Our sewerage was, was uh, made in the colonial times uh, when we were still colonized. I think we need to upgrade that, and I think that holds true even for a country like Libya. Our infrastructure should be rehabilitated. It should become green. There should be green, climate-proof, uh, rehabilitated infrastructure now, including roads, including buildings, hospitals, uh, schools, everything, especially on the coastal regions, especially in regions that are flood-prone. 
um, we should be looking at uh, other uh, climate solutions, including how to save, including ensuring there is no, con uh, there is there are no dwellings on floodplains, including making sure there's no construction on flood shoulders and on uh, on sorry, um, there's no construction on river banks on river shoulders, um, which is something that Pakistan really paid a heavy price for last last year. The list of solutions really goes on and on, but the but the narrative right. surrounding dams. Right, I was going to say, let, let's take some of that to Edmund for an engineering perspective. Yeah. How much of that is is possible, advisable? I, su I suppose, OK, if you look at critical infrastructure, we know as engineers what has to be done. The question is, is it being actually done? And, uh, you know, is, is the government in a particular country driving that? We know risk assessments should be done of all these uh, these things, be that whether it's a nuclear power plant or be it whether it's a dam. Uh, we know we should have resilience planning because uh, things can and will go wrong. There will be unexpected events. We need to think about the security of the, that infrastructure. Is it being maintained regularly? Uh, what's the emergency response? And I think that's that's a big one because, um, like, for example, here in Ireland, uh, the way we coordinate our emergency response, uh, we do have our defence forces involved, but the engineering response is... is uh, headed up by what we call the Office of Public Works, which is, uh, let's say, taking the engineering capacity into account of all these things. And there are plans in place around an emergency response when that's needed. And then you do have to invest to modernise and you do have to have keep the public aware of, uh, of all these things, you know. All right, that's a good point. You have to invest to modernise. I want to take that point back to uh, uh, to Sarah in Lahore and say, when you're talking about a country like Pakistan, that's it's got its own economic challenges, the long list that you referred to of changes that need to be made, I mean, frankly speaking, can countries afford that on their own? I think the first thing, the first step would probably be to make sure that climate change becomes a priority for any country. And for a country constantly within the throes of political upheaval, which Pakistan has been, climate change does tend to take a back burner. Um, that does tend to be put on the back burner. But that doesn't mean that we are not making efforts to combat climate change. For example, when the uh, floods hit us in 2022, we had about 12 dams, small dams, more like reservoirs, in the province of Balochistan that were affected. Four of them burst. Uh, a couple of them got developed cracks in them. But the government did act pretty fast. And that is something I wish the Libyan government had also done. They evacuated a lot of people that were living near the dams. There were good early warning systems in place. That is pertinent, especially for flood affected areas and for dams. Um, and then also the connection between dams and the meteorological department is very important. If, da if the dam management is not intimated, about um, uh, upcoming storms, about you know what the weather is looking like, whether they're going to be experiencing rainfall, then the dam management really can't do much. I don't know how the Libyan, uh, what, what was happening in Libya along these lines. Well, let's, but, let's find um, out, let, if we may, let's take the question to West Sweden and, and once again to Asma. Listening to what Sarah and Edmund are saying there, You've got to think that this requires a considerable investment, not only of money, but also of learning and know-how. Do countries which are challenged, not only with political instability, but economic challenges as well, really need international help? Well, Libya is not economically challenged. Um, it's, it's still quite um, wealthy given, given its, its oil resource, but it's, it's mismatched. It's, grossly mismanaged and actually not governed. Um, despite that the authorities, that we have two governments, they're governing very small areas uh, effectively. It's It falls to local governance and then we have their issues uh, that are both legal and political in terms of not getting them, you know, proper budgets, etc. So it's, there is no interest in the leadership, both in the East and the West, to actually govern the country. And so none of these things were in place, even though there are huge budgets for Ministry of Water, there's huge budgets for infrastructure and projects and contracted co companies from all over the world coming to, to work in the country. But it's not, it's it's been like that, uh, uh, even during Gaddafi's his era, that there's all these ambitious projects, but very little done. Uh, on the ground. And so it took them three days to get to get themselves to actually 
be, be able to respond and coordinate with each other, which is quite late for people who are still drowning and, and, and stuck on the rubble and waiting to be rescued. Uh, there's this, they have just managed now to release a, a, an official statement and a response and an emergency committee. And of course, the parliament has met uh, four days later to give themselves $10 billion budget to rebuild a city um, led by a man, the spokesman for the parliament, who was given a budget before to rebuild Benghazi and then after ISIS which they have not been built. So a very complex situation there. Edmund, can any organization, entity, international organization, entity be established to try and ensure dam safety around the world in areas where either it's plagued with political instability and corruption or they simply don't have the resources, no matter how good their administration is, they have the resources to do it alone? The, the engineering knowledge is there is the first thing. The question is, is there a political will in a particular part of the world? And that's the biggest factor in my view, you know, because ultimately you will need the technical expertise there on the ground to do whatever work needs to actually get done. And you can have all the international meetings you like, but unless the work actually happens on the ground, uh, you know, nothing's going to change with that piece of infrastructure. And I think, look, it really starts off with what's our approach to climate change? And uh, some people, you know, they consider it's not my problem or they don't see it as, as being a real problem. Um, and it's events like that that show us um, that it is a real problem. So we need to tackle it in two ways. One is about building resilience. So the world is changing. Uh, we are going to have more rain. We are going to have higher temperatures. How do we build resilience around that? And then the other area is adaptability. And this is more long term. So what are the things that we can do uh, to lessen the impact of climate change uh, and, you know, to prevent, uh, you know, it ri temperatures rising as fast because sea levels, uh, sea levels are rising. They're rising a couple of centimetres every year. Um, you know, fast forward that. Um, if you don't build flood defences in certain areas, uh, you know, they will be covered by the sea. That's That's a known fact. So, Edmund, just clarify for us, how easy you know? is the process of updating a dam? Look, a dam is very is a very significant uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, it's you know if you look at it from a civil engineering point of view, um, it's quite a big structure. Um, it, it is a big job to update a dam, but it's not necessary that necessarily all the dams need updating. Um, you know you can look at well what are the mitigation measures if you have excess rainfall, how is it managed? Um, you know even in the best parts of the world. Um, you can have events that where there are significant rainfall and they have to manage it. Um, they have to release the water. So, for example, even here in Ireland, uh, in what is, uh, you know, we had we had one dam that's at a hydroelectric plant in 2009. There was very, very significant rainfall. Uh, the people were monitoring that plant. They were in touch with the meteorologists. They could see that rain was falling. They had no choice uh, but to release water, but it was a controlled release of water. Right. Now, there was some flooding and it did cause damage and there was a lot of insurance claims as a result of that. Um, and that has that's ha that happens around the world, even in Germany two years ago. Uh, you'll see there was, a, there was a similar scenario. All right, we'll have to leave but it there. You should, we are but you shouldn't time, have this so catastrophic... We'll... Uh, you shouldn't have the catastrophic loss of life that well, we had we, in this scenario. Well, I think we can agree on that. No one wants catastrophic loss of life. For now, let's thank our guests, because we are out of time, Asma Khalifa, Sarah Hayat, and Edmund Harty. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the entire team here. For now, it's goodbye.